everyone. Welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, we are going to be learning about the oh so wonderful Scottish wildcat. This is a very, very special listener episode dedicated to Jill, C. Swan, and to Sophie. I think this might be the first episode in which I am shouting out three of you guys on just one episode, and I think that is so great. This episode would not be possible without you guys writing in with your wonderful suggestions, and this entire show would not be possible without each and every one of you out there listening and joining me in these very fun little episodes that we have together. And I just want to say that I know this episode is coming out a week later than it was supposed to, but unfortunately, I have already recorded this episode last week, but I forgot to change my microphone input. So I was talking and having having a lot of fun recording the episode, and little did I know I was using my laptop microphone, and that just sounded awful. So for those of you that don't know, I am a student full-time, and I do uh, have work along with other studies, so when I lose my footage or my recording because of my negligence, I guess you could say, it is so hard for me to find a time in which I can record again. Maybe in the future my schedule will come down a little bit so I can make up for my mistakes, but uh, I just want to apologize to you guys because I never like being late. But anyways, we're here today. I am so happy to have such great company with me in this episode because it is going to be a fun one. First, we have a review coming from a user called SD7713 who wrote in from the United States of America, not too far from Canada, where I am very happily residing. And SD writes, Great way to wind down before bed. Interesting and relaxing at the same time. Thank you, SD, for such a kind review. I love to read how the podcast helps you guys, and it really makes me feel just so grateful that I can be a part of your routine or anything that you use the show for. For some of you, it's a relaxing thing that maybe you'll do in the middle of the day, or maybe you're winding down at the end of a long work day, or maybe it's in the morning, whether you're relaxed and attentive or wanting to drift off to sleep. I am happy for the company. And I just want to mention that I have posted the first video of answering your animal questions. All are welcome to go onto the YouTube page, Relax with Animal Facts, and leave your questions for us to explore together. That is something that we've just started doing, and all the episodes are uploaded to YouTube from now on as well. I got my facts for this episode from mentalfloss.com and discoverwildlife.com. If you want to learn more about the Scottish wildcat and maybe some other furry, slimy, and scaly friends out there, I encourage you guys to check out those resources. I will leave them in the show notes. 
Now, enough dilly-dallying. This is the part of the show where we go into this relaxation period together, where we scan through our bodies and realize where we carry some unnecessary tension. For me, I'm recording this in the afternoon and I've had to do a lot of sitting from work. So for me, I feel tension in my shoulders and in my neck. So I'm going to do my best to relax those parts of my body. For you, it might be your legs. Maybe you've been walking around. Maybe you like to run marathons. Who knows? But what's important is that we relax those parts of our bodies together to the best of our abilities. No need to really force anything as we go into this immersive experience together into the woodlands where the Scottish wildcat resides. And so for the first fact, I think it is very important that we cover what is a Scottish wildcat in the first place? The Scottish wildcat is the last stronghold of European wildcat, or also known as Felis sylvestris. This species is native to Europe and the Caucasus. Keep in mind, guys, that I have a thick Canadian accent, I guess you can say, so many of these words I will butcher sometimes. Do not be afraid to send me an email and let me know what I pronounced wrong. And speaking of saying things incorrectly, if any of my Scottish listeners out there want to let me know if I say these places properly or not, I would love that. The Scottish wildcat in Britain is confined to Scotland, north of Glasgow and Edinburgh. Now, I don't know if I said that right, but I certainly hope so. And in the wild, they are thought to live between 10 and 12 years of age. So that is not so different from many of our domesticated house cats that we have. Of course, any animal that is domesticated will usually live longer than its wild counterpart for reasons that we actually covered on the YouTube channel. We can see how they are quite similar. And the Scottish wildcats are similar also in size to a domestic tabby cat, but they are larger and more robust. I searched up some videos and different comparison images between just regular cats that maybe some of my friends own and the Scottish wildcat, and at first I had some trouble distinguishing the two, but we'll get into in just a second how you can tell the difference. The average size of the head and body of a male wildcat is 59 centimeters, and the average female is 54 centimeters. The tail length will range from between 26 to 33 centimeters as well. So the tail isn't going to exceed its body length or anything, but we can see how it is about half of their body length. And on average, adult males will weigh over 5 kilograms and females 4 kilograms. So just a bit more on the male side in comparison to the female side something that is not terribly uncommon in the animal kingdom and with many of the animals we've covered on this show thus far. That isn't to say that sometimes that isn't the case because we have covered many animals in which it isn't. 
And if you wonder just how much their kittens weigh in on, maybe just for the sake of a adorable scale, it is between 100 to 160 grams. Usually it doesn't matter whether a cat is wild or not, they are prime suspects for being very adorable. Now say you are in Scotland in which you might have a chance to see these guys. We'll get more into what the chances of that are, but if you do see a cat that you are somewhat questioning, is that a domesticated cat or a Scottish wild cat? The first thing that you have to know is that it is difficult to distinguish a true wild cat from a wild cat domestic cat hybrid and population genetics studies have indicated that there are high levels of genetic dilution. Now all of these fancy terms and things like that in the end only mean that a lot of the wild cats out there could be hybrids between domesticated cats and true wild cats. The wild cats, however, are longer than domesticated cats and also have a bushy tail with a blunt black tip and thick stripes. The stripes on the body will also be darker and thicker and with no white patches. So when I searched up images between regular domesticated cats and true wild cats, what really gives it away for me is the tail. The tail looks very robust in comparison, very furry and very thick. So if I was to ever visit Scotland, which I so hope that I do one day for any of you Scottish listeners out there, Scotland is on one of my top lists to travel because of the history and the beautiful nature and scenery. I so hope that I can visit one day and maybe even meet some of you Scottish fans out there. So in terms of their habitat, they use what they call a mosaic of habitat types, which will often include broad-leaved or mixed woodland habitats, young coniferous plantations and open areas such as marginal farmland and grasslands are also used because they will support high densities of mammal prey. So wherever there's high densities of food for these guys, they will do their best to show up to the party. The next fact is one that I sort of knew, but never knew kind of the science behind it. So they will use grass to fight parasites. Wildcats are known to eat long blades of grass every so often, and these dense plants will help to clear the cat's digestive tract by forcing indigestible bones, fur, and feathers out of its system. And the swallowing of grass is also a good way to dislodge parasitic worms, which the cats regularly contract by eating raw meat. So eating grass is not something that is completely left to the Scottish wild cat. My dog, Molly, loves to eat grass. Of course, for her, it is a certain type of grass, along with many other dogs. They won't go for every bit of grass, but there are few kinds that they will eat. For me, it can be quite odd to see my carnivore of a dog eating 
just vegetables. I think it's really cute, but it can be an odd sight to see. And according to the Scottish Wildcat Association, large dogs, park rangers, and ill-prepared veterinarians are among the most common recipients of non-hunting wildcat attacks. So just like many other animals that we've learned about on the show, if they feel threatened, they will oftentimes retaliate. But it is not their favorite thing in the world, at least not to my knowledge. One of their forms of communication is through poop. Solitary by nature, adult wildcats generally give each other a wide berth outside of the breeding season. Data collected from radio callers have revealed that an average female spends most of its time within a one square mile home range. Males are also thought to have similar habits. And sometimes in these home ranges, they will drop, I suppose, little presents for the express purpose of communication. And this form of communication can be so effective that just through the smell, a passing cat can assess the sex, age, and reproductive status of that animal. How amazing is that? And how grateful I am that as humans, we have different forms of communication. And you might be wondering how many Scottish wildcats out there there actually are. The Mammal Society's Population and Conservation Status of British Mammals, that is quite a long name, estimated a population of only 200 wildcats in Scotland. However, the range that the population could be was between 30 to 430 individuals. The data on Scottish wildcats is poor, and arriving at an exact figure is difficult due to the widespread hybridization that we learned about earlier. It is even possible that there are no wildcats in Scotland that do not have some domestic cat ancestry, and so the numbers remaining might depend just on how you define a wild cat. This can happen quite often in the animal kingdom and is not exclusive to the Scottish wild cat. While some might say that genetic diversity is a vast great thing, it does make it difficult for researchers to really keep a tab on these guys. But anyways, let's talk about kittens for a second, because who doesn't want to talk about baby cats? Scottish wild cats will usually mate in February, but the mating period can be a bit broader than this, and so birth periods can also be broader as well. Litters of between two and six kittens are usually born in May, but can be born later in the year. This will only produce one litter per year, and these kittens are weaned and stay with their mother until they are about five months old. I think it is always amazing to see the difference of times in which animals are given to become adult and fully independent. In the case of some animals, it is right from birth. For others, such as the Scottish wildcat, it may take a few months. And then comparing to primate species, those that are so genetically similar to us, 
they can be utterly dependent on their mothers for six to eight years. And that only goes up with us as humans. Well, their main prey is going to be rabbits, hares, and small mammals. However, their diet is related to the availability of prey. They will also eat amphibians, reptiles, insects, and some grass and bracken, as well as fairly large birds, and they will sometimes act the role of scavenger in picking up on animals that have just been killed by other animals or, unfortunately, by cars on the road. And if you're wondering where you can get a glimpse of these majestic wildcats, it can be difficult. They are elusive and very rare, but they are best spotted between dusk and dawn around woodland clearings or grassland edges bordering scrub or forest. In summer, they can be seen in open moorland. Scottish wildcats are also kept in captivity in a number of locations. So if you want to know where you can see one for sure, maybe there is one in your area if you are somewhere around Scotland or somewhere close by. And for the last fact of the episode, which we usually give to the name, I think we can all sort of figure out why the Scottish wildcat is called the Scottish wildcat. So instead, I am going to read to you a story coming from Cheshire of some wildcats. So the Scottish wildcats at the Chester Zoo in Cheshire Female Einick and male Cromarty welcomed an adorable kitten into the world, the first to be born at the zoo as a part of its Scottish wildcat breeding program. The arrival of the new kitten is a major boost to the increasingly important captive population in Britain. Tim Rowlands, Chester Zoo's curator of mammals, said in a statement, Conservation breeding in zoos is a key element in the wider plan to conserve the species in the UK, and drawing on the unique skills, knowledge, and know-how of the carnivore experts working here, we are breeding Scottish wildcats to increase the safety net population and hope to release their offspring into the highlands of Scotland in the future. Isn't that just such a wonderful story in which they are trying their best to help the Scottish wildcat numbers? What an encouraging way for us to end the facts. Even though this is my second time around learning about these guys, it was just as fun as the first. And I really encourage all of you out there listening to reach out and send in your animal suggestions. We already have so many of you in our animal podcast family And for those of you listening to this right now, you are a part of that community. So if you haven't reached out either through email or to the Instagram, relax with animal facts to tell me about your favorite animal that you would like to learn about on the show, please do so. I love getting messages from you guys and talking to you about your favorite animals. For those of you that support the show in whichever way that you do, whether it is following on Spotify, subscribing, and leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, or supporting it 
financially through PayPal and Patreon. You guys have my utmost gratitude, as well as those of you who just like to listen without doing any of those things. I am simply grateful for the company, and I look forward to seeing you guys on the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.